Did you know that the Bible sitting in your home, your church, or even in your hands right now isn't the same as it was in 1775? That's right. A version of the Bible from 1775 held within its pages hidden revelations, verses that have since been censored, changed, or erased entirely. What was in those pages that made them so dangerous? What truths were so disruptive that they had to be removed? And more importantly, why were they removed in the first place? Imagine this for a moment. Everything you know about your faith, your connection with God, and even the church itself might have been based on something incomplete, or worse, something deliberately altered. The Bible we read today is not the same as it was centuries ago, and it's not just due to translation differences or printing errors. No, the changes were far more deliberate. But what did they change, and why? Let's dive into the hidden truths of the 1775 Bible and uncover the secrets they don't want you to know. Let's start with a question. Who decides what goes into your Bible? Most people would say God, right? But here's the unsettling truth. It's not divine handwriting in the clouds that's responsible for what made it into the Bible. It's men, powerful men, men with agendas. Over centuries, They've shaped the Bible to fit a specific narrative, deciding which parts you're allowed to see and which parts they chose to leave out. And this wasn't just about grammar or translation. It was about control. One of the most shocking examples of this is how the 1775 Bible describes the relationship between humanity and God. In many ways, it presented a radically different view of spirituality than the Bible we have today. Rather than a distant, hierarchical God— a God who seems so far away that you need a church or priest to speak on your behalf. The 1775 Bible suggested something much more intimate, that the divine isn't above or beyond you, it's within you. Think about that for a second. If the divine is within you, that changes everything. It means you have power. It means you don't need the institutional church. It means you don't need someone else to mediate your connection to God. And that's exactly why these verses were removed. They were too empowering. They gave people too much independence. They made people question the necessity of the church, and those in power couldn't have that. This wasn't just a matter of belief. It was a hidden battle for control. During the late 18th century, religious leaders, scholars, and political figures were quietly debating which parts of the Bible were too dangerous to be included. They weren't arguing over punctuation or phrasing. They were deciding whether people should be allowed to access verses that empowered them, that encouraged them to seek their own spiritual path, without the need for the church to act as an intermediary. Let's pause here and really think about this. What happens when people are empowered? What happens when they realize they don't need a priest or an institution to have a relationship with God? The entire structure of religious authority starts to crumble. And so, in the shadows of history, the 1775 Bible was altered, changed in ways that most people don't even realize today. Words were erased, passages omitted, and in their place, a version of scripture that reinforced obedience, hierarchy, and control was crafted. The Bible was no longer just a spiritual text. It became a tool, a tool for controlling the masses. Let me share with you one of the most startling examples. In the 1775 Bible, there were key passages that spoke to a deeply personal relationship with God, without the need for a mediator. These passages made it clear that the divine wasn't something far away, something you had to earn access to. It was something that lived within you. But these verses were systematically removed. Why? Because they threatened the church's authority. If people believed they didn't need the church to connect with God, the church would lose its grip on power. Now, let's talk about something even more fundamental. The name of God. Most of us are familiar with names like God, Lord, or Jehovah. But did you know that in earlier versions of the Bible, including the 1775 edition, the name used for God was completely different? In those earlier texts, the name used was Elohim. And here's where it gets interesting. Elohim isn't singular. It's plural. Stop and think about that for a second. A plural name for God? 
If you've grown up believing in a single, all-powerful deity, this should raise some serious questions. Elohim suggests something far more complex, perhaps even a council of divine beings rather than just one. So, why change it? Why simplify it into something so much more rigid, like God or Lord? The answer, again, lies in control. By simplifying the concept of God into a singular, authoritarian figure, the Church reinforced its own authority. If there's only one God, there's only one source of divine truth, and that truth, conveniently, comes from the Church. But if Elohim had been left in the Bible, if people had been allowed to see God as something more complex and multifaceted, it would have been much harder for the Church to centralize power. Think about it. How do you claim divine mandate when the divine itself is plural, diverse, and perhaps even exists in different forms? By altering the name of God, they weren't just changing a word. They were simplifying theology and, in doing so, reinforcing a power structure that kept the masses in line. It wasn't just the name of God that was altered. Entire books of the Bible, whole chapters and stories, have been erased from the version you hold in your hands today. These are the so-called lost books of the Bible. These texts offered a radically different view of Christianity, one that focused more on personal enlightenment and self-discovery rather than blind obedience to religious rules. Books like the Gospel of Thomas, the Book of Enoch, and the Wisdom of Solomon were once part of the broader biblical tradition. These weren't fringe writings. They were considered sacred by early Christian communities. But they didn't make the final cut. Why? because they gave people too much freedom. They suggested that divine knowledge could be accessed by anyone by you, if you were willing to seek it. Take the book of Enoch, for example. This ancient text delved into the story of fallen angels, the origins of evil, and a cosmic battle between good and evil that went far beyond the simple narrative most of us learned in Sunday school. Enoch was said to have been taken up to heaven and given secrets that were too powerful for ordinary humans. Could that be why this book was removed? Because it challenged the traditional narrative in ways that were simply too dangerous for the church to allow. And then there's the Gospel of Thomas. This text is mind-blowing. It doesn't focus on miracles or parables like the four canonical Gospels. Instead, it's a collection of sayings attributed directly to Jesus— and these sayings paint a very different picture of Christ. Jesus isn't teaching about sin, repentance, or judgment in the Gospel of Thomas. Instead, he talks about self-knowledge, personal enlightenment, and the idea that the kingdom of God is already within you, not in some distant heaven, but here and now, inside each and every person. This message, that the divine is already within you, is incredibly powerful. And it's exactly why the Gospel of Thomas was removed from the official Bible. It threatened the institutional church because it placed spiritual authority back in the hands of the individual. If you believe that you have a direct connection with God, if you believe that the kingdom of heaven is within you, then why would you need the church? Why would you need someone else to tell you how to live your spiritual life? And that's the point, isn't it? The powerful didn't want you to realize how close you truly are to the divine. They didn't want you to know that you don't need them to interpret God's will for you. They wanted to keep you in the dark. One of the most alarming changes to the Bible over the centuries isn't just what was added or removed. It's how we've come to understand fundamental concepts like hell. The fiery, eternal pit of damnation that's preached in churches today? It's barely in the original text. In fact, the words that were used in the Bible before it was translated into English had a much more nuanced meaning. Words like Sheol, Hades, and Gehenna didn't describe the hell we're familiar with. Instead, they referred to things like the grave, the underworld, or even a physical location outside Jerusalem where trash was burned. So, how do we get from those ancient terms to the terrifying concept of hell that dominates modern Christian thought? Once again, it comes down to deliberate choices made by translators and church leaders. By shifting the meaning of these words, they turned hell into a tool of fear. It became much easier to control people when you could convince them that there was something worse than death awaiting them if they didn't follow the church's teachings. At this point, you might be wondering, 
What else has been altered? How much of the Bible we know today has been reshaped to fit the needs of those in power? The truth is, we may never know the full extent of the changes, but what we do know is enough to raise serious questions about the integrity of the modern Bible. What we're reading today isn't the same as what was read centuries ago. Verses have been added, removed, and altered. Entire books have been lost. And through it all, the message of personal empowerment and direct connection with the divine has been systematically erased. So, what can we do with this knowledge? The first step is to question. Don't take everything at face value. Dive deeper into history. Seek out the lost books and ask yourself, what kind of relationship with God do you want to have? One that's mediated through institutions and controlled by those in power? Or one that's personal, direct, and empowering? The answers lie within you, waiting to be uncovered. Just like the hidden truths of the 1775 Bible. 